Samuel chapter 14. First Samuel chapter 14. Um, I'd like to read verses 1 to 7 to uh, set the scene for tonight's message. My third message in the Jonathan series. I love uh, that name, Jonathan. It's my middle name. Um, I've always loved it. I'm glad my mother gave it to me. Well, actually, she didn't give it to me. My my mother wanted to call me John. But my father went and registered the name Jonathan. So uh, uh, I think he he, he did a good thing. So I've got my father to thank you for the name uh, because I love Jonathan, the, the, the person I was named after. And that's what we're lear- who we're learning about on uh, my preaching times on Sunday nights. So let me just read verses 1 to 14 of 1 Samuel, uh, sorry, 1 to 7 of verse, uh, chapter 14. 1 Samuel 14, 1 to 7. <clears throat> now it came to pass on the day, upon a day that Jonathan the son of Saul said unto the young man that bare his armour, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under the, a pomegranate tree which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. And Ahiah, Ahiah, the son of Ahiatub, Ichapod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. The people knew not that Jonathan was gone. Between the passages by which Jonathan sought to go over unto the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other side, and the name of the one was Bozes and the name of the other Sinah. The forefront of the one was situate northward over against Michmash, and the other southward over against Gibeah. And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armour, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of the uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by a few. And his armour bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart, turn thee. Behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. And uh, we, we do thank the Lord for the, the reading of his word. I ask you to join with me as we commit our message to him. Father, we thank you for all the wonderful songs we've been able to sing this evening. Uh, we thank you that uh, we have a saviour uh, that we can sing, sing about. And Father, now as we open the word, I pray that your Holy Spirit would make any application that needs to be made. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As I've said, I want to continue my uh, looking at the life of Jonathan, the son of Saul. Now, last time I was, uh, uh, we were here, we saw that uh, the, the beginning, if you like, of the, what I call the Battle of Michmash. The Battle of Michmash. Of course, the Israelites were at war with the Philistines, and this was just one of the, the battles. A war. Uh, usually uh, involves lots of different battles. And this is, uh, this is one in the early time of the war with the Philistines. In the war with the Philistines, uh, despite being hopelessly outnumbered, as we learnt last time, Jonathan and his armour bearer uh, decided to take on a whole garrison of Philistine soldiers. Uh, be- the Israelites were being occupied by the Philistine forces and there were various garrisons around uh, the land just to make sure that the Israelites didn't, uh, you know, rebel against the Philistines. And so at this point uh, in uh, Jonathan's story, he decided, uh, and he uh, got his armour bearer to join, join him, he just decided to go and attack one of these garrisons. Uh, we see the scheme in verse, uh, in verse 1, it came to pass that Upon a day that Jonathan the son of Saul said to the young man that bare his armour, Come, and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. At this point, uh, the Israelites were up on one uh, hill, and there was a valley in between, and the Philistines were on another uh, hill or a plateau. And uh, so here uh, Jonathan asks his his, uh, armour bearer to join him, to go over down the valley and up uh, to where the Philistines were, and to attack. Now, I'm not sure what Jonathan hoped to achieve 
uh, with his plan because there was, there was just going to be two of them against thousands. Who knows how many thousands? The Bible wouldn't even give a number for the amount of uh, infantry that the Philistines had brought over. But he wasn't just going to sit around like his father and hope for a miracle or plan a surrender. And there was Saul, his father, sitting up under the, under the pomegranate tree and he was, didn't seem to be to have any idea of what to do. Perhaps he was going to surrender to the Philistines. Well, before he could, Jonathan enacted his plan. Now, we, see, we saw his strategy in verses 6 to 8. Uh, Jonathan said to the young man, there, bear his armour, come and let us go over unto the garrison, garrison of the uh, uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint of the Lord to save by many or by few. And his armour bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart, turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. And then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves to them. If they say thus uh, unto us, Tarry until we come to you, then we will stand in our place, and we will not go up unto them. But if they say, Come unto us, then we will, uh, we will go up. For the Lord hath delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign to us. So the plan was very simple. Sneak uh, through the valley and, and go up that hill and pass between those two significant rocks. And once we're up, up there uh, and we can see the Philistines, let's, uh, let's discover ourselves. Let's reveal ourselves to the Philistines. It sounds like a terrific plan, doesn't it? And he said, well, if the, if the Philistines that we see there uh, tell us to tarry, if they tell us just to wait there and we'll come to you, uh, then we'll stay. We'll stay there and we'll see what happens. It doesn't really say what he'd do if they did say that. But if the Philistines say, come to us, well, we'll see that as a sign that God wants us to fight them and that the Lord is with us. And so that was... Uh, Jonathan's strategy. Now we have no record that God told Jonathan that he would give him a sign. Uh, but Jonathan decided himself uh, that he would take it that way. There would only be two options. They'd say, wait and we'll come and fight you or come to us uh, and we'll fight you. Uh, so he saw that second option as a sign from the Lord. But uh, as I said, there's no record that that was something that God Old Jonathan would be a sign. But he took it that way. Um, but the things we, we've learned about Jonathan so far is that he was a man of courage. I mean, for, just, for two of them to go up uh, over the hill and take on a garrison, he must have been a man of courage. He wasn't sitting up in the pomegranate tree with his father, uh, sending other soldiers. He was, he was a man of courage. He was going to go and do it himself. And he was a man of faith. That's what we learned last time. Um, he believed that the Lord could save by a few. He said the Lord can save by many or the Lord can save by a few. I'm sure he'd been raised on the stories of Shamgar with his ox goad and of Samson with the jawbone of an ass. Just one man would take on a whole bunch of the enemy. Uh, and he knew that, he, that God could save by many. He must have heard of the stories of Joshua and all the armies of Israel as they took uh, the land of Canaan. And so he knew that God could, could uh, save by many or by a few. And so with courage and faith, he and his armour bearer climbed through the, those two great rocks, Bozes and Senna, and they discovered themselves to the enemy. And... Uh, when they got up there, it seems like this was the edge of the Philistine uh, or perimeter of the Philistine uh, garrison. And when they got there, we read what I've called the sarcasm. Uh, have a look in verses 11, just the beginning of verse 12. And both of them discovered themselves unto the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armour bearer and said, Come to us and we will show you a thing. So here were our two intrepid soldiers. And as they came over that hill and uh, they, they 
looked at and the, Phar- the, Philistine, the Philistine army would have just gone from one end of their vision to the other end. And so here those two guys standing in front of this huge Philistine army. Now, if that was me, I wouldn't even be there. <laughs> but when I would have seen the, you know, the extent of the army, I would have probably said, no, this is not a good idea. But uh, no, Jonathan stood his ground. And when uh, uh, some of the Philistine soldiers who were that part of the garrison saw Jonathan and the armour bearer, they very sarcastically commented, oh, behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. Now, it wasn't so much uh, entirely sarcasm because that's exactly where a lot of the Israelites were. Saul only had 600 soldiers to fight this great massive army of the Philistines and the reason was because the Hebrews, the Israelites, were (laughs) hiding in the holes around the hills of uh, Benjamin. But when uh, uh, these Philistine soldiers, we know there were at least 20 of them, when they saw these two Israelites, uh, they sarcastically, uh, they made this sarcastic comment. And when I read this, I, I, it occurred to me how brave people can be when the odds are about two to 10,000. I think you can be really brave when you're in the 10,000, can't you? And you can be as sarcastic as you like. But Jonathan wasn't worried about the sarcasm. He just heard these words, come up, uh, sorry, come to us. That's all he heard, come to us. That was the sign. Uh, I could just see his heart welling up, thinking, ha that's the sign I was looking for. Now, God hadn't told him that he would give him a sign, but he took it as a sign from God. And so he said, wow, this is the sign. And uh, so we read of the slaughter, the slaughter that happened. And it wasn't the slaughter of the two men. Uh, surprisingly, in verse 12, and the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armour bearer and said, come up to us, we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said unto his armour bearer, Come up after me, uh, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. Oh, wow. He was so he sees excitement. He thought this was a sign from the Lord uh, telling him that he was going to have the victory. Now, the Jonathan's response here to what the um, Philistines uh, said to do. I think it's rather telling. Uh, He said, uh, come up after me, he spoke to his armour bearer, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. I want you to notice that Jonathan believed that it was the Lord who would give him the victory. He wasn't depending on his own skill as a soldier. He wasn't depending on his own um, own strength. Um, He he didn't have, uh, he wasn't like one of the judges who had, you know, like Samson of the, or anything like that. He was an ordinary man. But he was, he was relying on the Lord to give him the victory. And I want you to notice that he wasn't thinking of personal victory. He was thinking of national victory. He didn't say, for the Lord hath delivered them into my hands or into our hands. What he did say was, the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. He saw this as a sign that God was going to give victory to his people. He wasn't fighting for personal glory. He was fighting for Israel, God's people. And so he was trusting the Lord to give him the victory and he was fighting for the Lord. And these qualities we see in, in, in Jonathan are ones that we can all emulate. When we live for the Lord and when we serve the Lord, we should do it in his strength. And if we don't live for the Lord and we don't serve the Lord in his strength, we'll all burn out. Uh, We won't last that long. We've got to see that we, if we're going to have the victory, if we're going to live this life that God wants us to live, then we have to, um, and we will need the strength of the Lord to do it. Not only that, uh, we need the the Lord uh, to do his work in us and through us. And whatever we do, it shouldn't be for personal glory. Uh, but it should be for him and it should be for his kingdom. The reason we do what we do is not for uh, people might think that we're any good in one area or another or we're a nice person or we're a great preacher or we're a good teacher or something. What we should be doing, our motivation should be not for personal glory but for 
Christ and his kingdom. Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. We preach not ourselves and we serve for Jesus' sake. I believe this was Jonathan's attitude here when he uh, climbed up there through, through those two great rocks and stood there before those uh, at least 20 Philistine soldiers. I believe this was his attitude in his call to arms. Jonathan said unto his armour bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. He was there in the Lord's strength to do the Lord's work, and we can emulate those qualities. And so uh, the Philistines said to come to them, and so they did. And so the slaughter began. Now, that's not my word. That's what God's word says. Uh, let, me, let me read verses 13 and 14. And Jonathan climbed upon his hands and upon his feet and his armour bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan, and his armour bearer slew after him. And that, first, and that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armour bearer made was about 20 men, within, as it were, a half an acre of land which a yoke of oxen, oxen might plough. What we read here was the first slaughter because there was going to be another slaughter after this. And we have to remember that only Jonathan had a sword and a shield. His armour bearer didn't. I don't know what armour he was bearing. Maybe he had a, you know, a spear. Uh, maybe he had a bow and arrow. Uh, maybe he carried Jonathan's uh, shield for a while. Or he, maybe he had an axe because uh, that's what the Israelites had done. They'd got all their farm Im- implements and they sharpened them up. And that's what they'd gone to war with. But we've got to understand, here is, uh, here is uh, Jonathan. He's the only one with a sword and a shield. Uh, I suppose behind him was his armour bearer with whatever he had. Uh, and on came these 20 Philistines. And, and Jonathan, he just started to knock them down with his sword and his shield. And, and as they went down, the armour bearer sort of ran them through with his uh, with whatever implement he had, whether it was his axe or his hoe or whether it was a spear. Uh, And so Jonathan would fell them and and the armour bearer would finish them off. And uh, that went on uh, for as long as it took to kill 20 Philistines. Jonathan's not a little wimpy kid, is he? He's not a a sort of a a, 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 a sort of soft... uh, a um, person who's afraid to get his hands dirty. He is a true warrior. He was a true warrior. And uh, he, here he was uh, killing 20 Philistines with just one sword and one shield. Now, it's interesting that um, the scriptures all tell us the, the measurements in which um, he, 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 he slaughtered these 20 Philistines. Uh, it's half an acre of land. And most of modern people wouldn't know what that was. I think it's about 0.4 of a hectare. Now, I don't know how big this property is. Uh, anybody idea? Is there any idea for how big this property would be? Would it be that big? 0.4 of a hectare? Huh? Pardon? It's all square metres now. 4,000 square metres. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. So, so it would be a bit similar to this, wouldn't it? Half the size of this. So, um, yeah, so it, w- it would have been fairly hectic. <laughs> uh, but um, Jonathan, there he stood. He felled them. Armour bearer finished them. And what we learn here is that Jonathan was willing to put his life on the line for the Lord in the nation. He, he relied on the Lord and he did his part. And I think that's a good path for us all to take. Um, it's, it's one thing to have great ideas. People come to me with great ideas and we go, why doesn't the church do this and why doesn't the church do that? And that's, they might be good <laughs> ideas, but they don't want to actually have to do it themselves. And I'll say to people, well, that's a great idea if you are willing to do it. Uh, we've got to be willing to, you know, to do our part. Uh, and uh, and it, it will cost us something to do our part to serve the Lord and, uh, but if we are willing to do our part, then, uh, then the Lord will honour our efforts. Well, here he was. Uh, he'd uh, killed 20 Philistines. Um, 
And what we read next seems to vindicate Jonathan's scheme. Uh, if he would still sit under that pomegranate tree with his father, wondering what to do, uh, maybe this wouldn't have happened. I would suggest it wouldn't have. I think God was waiting for somebody in Israel to do something, somebody in Israel to trust him and look to him. Um, so maybe the Lord was waiting for that to happen because, you see, he, after Jonathan had killed these 20 Philistine, Philistines, the Lord intervened, and we read in verse 15, and there was trembling in the host, in the field, and among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers, they also trembled, and the earth quaked. So it was a very great trembling. And so here we see what I've called the shaking. And it was just, um, it was just as if God had, at this point, leaned down and just grabbed hold of some, you know, some of the ground or the trees and just shook the earth. It wouldn't take him much to, to shake the earth. I'm not sure that even the, the Israelites up on their uh, hill, I don't know if it even shook up there, but it definitely shook down uh, or, or in, the, in the place where the Philistine garrison was and not just the garrison because it makes reference to the spoilers. Uh, the garrison was the garrison that was already there that Jonathan attacked and... Uh, the spoilers were the three armies that had come uh, from Philistine to, to quell the, uh, the Israelite rebellion. And so the, the Lord shook the ground wherever there was a Philistine standing. And uh, it's clear to me that the Lord did have a miracle uh, for Israel. But he waited for somebody to act first and that somebody was Jonathan. The whole Philistine army were caught in the earthquake. And it caused pandemonium, as you can imagine, verse 16. And the watchmen of, of Saul in Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude melted away, <coughs> and they went on beating down one another. And so up on the other hill where uh, the watchmen uh, for Saul were watching on the other side of the valley where the uh, Philistines were when they, they, they saw this, this uh, pandemonium, ha- pandemonium happening, Uh, They observed that the the whole uh, multitude of the Philistine army melted away. It's very picturesque uh, language. And the the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah looked and behold, the multitude melted away. It it was once a solid block of soldiery and it was just melting into smaller parts. And that was because in the panic of the earthquake, they all started to fight each other there. Philistines all started to fight each other, beating one another down. That's what the verse says. Now we need to remember that the Philistines, the Philistines' army was not one harmonious army. Um, they were the combined army of five separate city-states. And uh, so it wouldn't have taken them much uh, to turn on each other. I can imagine when the ground shook and somebody turned around and maybe lashed out in fear and just was somebody from a different city, I can imagine then it all being on. It would have been similar to the Syrian militia of today. You hear all the, of all the opposition forces in Syria today that are rebelling against the Syrian government. Uh, the, the opposition forces are fractured and they spend as much time fighting each other as they do fighting the government. So it shouldn't surprise us that in the panic of the earthquake, the Philistine army fractured and began fighting each other. And it was only then when, uh, when Saul heard uh, the watchman say, there's something happening in the camp of the Philistines, it's only then did, did the King Saul's courage slowly start to rise. But how had this happened? He wasn't sure. Was he seeing, what, was he, what, what was, they were seeing over there, was that because some of his army had gone over and were causing all this trouble in the camp? It doesn't seem like he'd felt the earthquake. Maybe that earthquake was just specific to the, the area where the Philistine army was. And so Saul, he wasn't sure how this had happened, had some of his army gone over there and caused this trouble. And so he commanded a, a head count. Have a look at verse 17. Then said Saul unto the people that were with him, Number now and see who is gone from us. And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armour bearer were not there. 
there were just two gone, and one of them was his oldest son. And how was it possible then that they could have caused all of that pandemonium? (laughs) But even knowing that something was happening in that Philistine camp, Saul still wouldn't move. He procrastinated further. And so he'd asked the priest to inquire of the Lord. Verse 18, And Saul said unto Ahiah, Bring hither the ark of God. Uh, For the ark of God was at that time with the children of Israel. And so uh, he was uh, hearing all the news uh, stories about what was going on over there and he's sort of scratching his head and trying to figure out what it was and called for the priest and will inquire of the Lord. And while the priest is getting, getting everything ready so that he could do all the things that he needs to do, the noise in the Philistine camp grew so loud, finally Saul decided to act. Verse 19, And it came to pass while Saul talked unto the priest that the noise that was in the host of the Philistines went on and increased. And Saul said unto the priest, Withdraw thine hand. Uh, uh, To withdraw thine hand. uh, What what he's saying to the priest is, you know, stop putting on the ephod uh, or opening the breastplate of Urim and Thummim, if that's what he was doing, or or placing the ark in a proper position to inquire before it, or stop lifting up his hands before... Whatever he was doing uh, to inquire of the Lord, he said, stop doing it. Because uh, Saul finally realised it was time to act. So... Saul then rallied his troops and headed over to the Philistine camp. Oh, he's so brave, very brave now. Verse 20 to 22. So and Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves and they came to the battle. And behold, every man's sword was against his fellow and there was a very great discomfiture. Moreover, the Hebrews that were with the Philistines before that time, which went up with them into the camp from the country round about, even they also turned to be with the Israelites that were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, all the men of Israel, which had hid themselves in Mount Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, even they also uh, followed hard after them in battle. When Saul and his army of 600 entered the Philistine camp, they could see that the Philistines were all killing each other. Not only that, some of the Hebrews, some of the Israelites, who had either collaborated with the Philistines, uh, Philistines were the occupying force, and, and whenever that happens in any country, there are collaborators so who, you know, they want to sort of, they don't want to fight the uh, people of the occupying force. They just collaborate with them, whether they were collaborators or whether they'd been captured by the Philistines and they were servants to the Philistines. But those Hebrews that were in the Philistines' camp, they saw their opportunity and they started to fight against the Philistines. And so the Philistines were fighting each other, and these Hebrews that were in their in their ranks were fighting against them as well. The word then spread that the Philistines were on the run. So those two scared to fight before now came out of their hiding places to chase after the spooked Philistines. I can imagine many in Saul's army would have found weapons when they got to that battle, that first battlefield uh, where the garrison had been and where Jonathan had been, when they got to that where where the Philistines were first killing each other. I'm sure that uh, when the Israelites got there, they would have found lots of weapons that had been discarded by those who had been killed. And so the Israelite army would have been partially rearmed. And so they would have even had more confidence because there were only two swords and two shields in the whole of Israel up until that point. And so with the Philistines on the run and with people coming out from the, down from the hills and chasing and partially being rearmed, they were able to chase the Philistines. Now we have an account of the chase in the remainder of the chapter and that's really what the remainder of the chapter is about. Um, and, but I'm going to leave that till next time because Jonathan once again plays a vital role. But the summary of the Battle of Michmash, and this is really the battle that occurred just in that little area. The summary of that is in verse 23. And it says this, So the Lord saved Israel that day. That's it. So the Lord saved Israel that day. And I think that our hero, Jonathan, would be the first to have said amen to that. (laughs) If somebody had said, the Lord saved us today, Jonathan would have been the first to say, amen. I believe 
that he did. It was the Lord's doing. I know that he would have said, I'm, in, I'm into that because he went up to the, against that garrison believing that the Lord could save by many or a few. He believed that. Uh, secondly, he saw the sign he was looking for. He saw that sign as the Lord leading him. He was looking for the Lord's leading. And second, thirdly, he was fighting for Israel. He was fighting for God's people. He wasn't fighting for his own glory. He was fighting for the Lord. And so I think he would have been the first to acknowledge that this victory was the Lord's doing. Now, I'm not sure what his plan would have been or was after he killed those first 20 Philistines. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Um, I don't know if you've ever wrestled with somebody. Uh, wrestling is the most tiring thing you, you can do. But imagine having to fell 20 men, soldiers, <laughs> and then kill them uh, in, in a small space of time in a small place. I think he would have been exhausted. And I think he, he would have been the most relieved person there in that whole place when the ground began to shake. He probably didn't have a plan after those 20. The Lord had responded to his faith and he took over when he had done his part. You know, that's the Lord, what the Lord will do for all who serve him. The Lord gives us a mandate and we must believe the Lord's promises and we must do our part in, 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 with courage and faith. And when, and when we have done our part, uh, the Lord will take over. And so Jonathan is a good example for us as we serve the Lord. So the chase was on. And now Saul got his... his, his uh, uh, He's left his pomegranate tree and he's in the fight. And uh, sadly, uh, because of that, he nearly brought about Jonathan's demise, which we'll learn about next time. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for Jonathan's example. <clears throat> we know that, Father, that this is a story of, of fighting and killing. And, uh, Lord, in some ways it's something that we, none of us will ever experience, but it was... Lord, what was required at the time. We thank you for that he was, or Jonathan was a warrior uh, that the people needed. But we thank you that, Lord, he looked to you and believed in you, that he was a man of courage and faith. And, uh, Father, I pray that you would help us uh, as we live for you and as we serve you, and that we would do it not in our own strength but in your strength, and that we will, Lord, uh, do it for your sake, for Jesus' sake. Thank you, Lord, for Jonathan and for the message tonight in Jesus' name.